Namaste, and welcome to another episode of Uladu Narpadu. So today we're going to look into verse 38. If we are the doer of actions, karmas, which are like seeds, we shall experience the resulting fruits. But when one knows oneself by inquiring who is the doer of actions, in other words, who am I, the sense of I am the doer will disappear. Hence, all three types of karma, agamya, sanchita, and prarabdha, will slip away, since the ego, the doer of the actions, and the experiencer of their fruits, will no longer exist. The resulting state, which is devoid of ego, and which is consequently devoid of the bondage of karma, indeed is the state of liberation, which is eternal, that is, our ever-existing natural state. So, Uladu Narpadu is about what is, the nature of reality. Uladu, uh, in Tamil, means that which is, what is real, what always is, and what cannot not be. But we are separated from that by ego, by the sense of individuality. And so we assign ourselves in the sense of the ego, the individual identity, the role of the doer, not realizing that that also assigns us as the recipient of the resulting karmas. So there are three types of karmas discussed in this verse. Agamya karma means the actions newly performed in this life through the sense of I am the doer, the ego. Sanchita karma means all the results of all the past agamya karmas which are in storage, so to speak, uh, and which have not been selected for experiencing in this life. And finally, the prarabdha karma is the share of the karmas selected by Ishwara, not by us, but by Ishwara, to be experienced in this life. So remember, in the life of the ego, in the individual existence, there is God, Ishwara, there is the world, Maya, and there is the body, and the body is taken as the self. So in this world, the body is moved around and does various things which we take credit for. I'm the doer. Uh, and because of this, we have to receive the karmic results. This is bondage. Why? Because it means we lose our freedom and our life, our existence, and everything that happens becomes determined by karmas. And also because of ignorance, we don't understand what kinds of results these karmas will bring. We're only thinking, oh, I want to enjoy. I want to do this. I want to do that. Huh? I want to own things. I want to possess things. And I want to enjoy them through sense contact. Well, okay. But there are three modes, gunas of material nature. Sattva guna, or goodness, rajoguna, or passion, and tamoguna, or ignorance. And the results of actions performed in these three modes 
are of the same quality as the actions themselves. So in other words, if one performs actions in goodness, charity, religious worship, study of the scriptures, different kinds of pujas, different kinds of beneficial activities in general, uh, acquisition of knowledge and so on, these will lead to what we call good results. <laughs> what we really mean by that is results in the mode of goodness. Now, these results are just as binding as any other kind of karma, but because they lead in the general direction of liberation, the wise encourage people to perform them. Thus, even though we are engaged in jnana yoga, we advise people who aren't ready for this uh, topmost level of realization to engage in karma yoga, bhakti yoga, and raja yoga in that order. Actually, one yoga will naturally develop into the next just by its becoming mature. So one should have right view on this. That's why we gave in our esoteric teaching series the instructions of Bhagavan in the Upadesha Sara uh, that one should begin from the Karma Yoga. So do good things, perform charitable works. Uh, the other kind is Raja. Raja uh, means passion because kings, of course, to be a king you have to fight. And to fight, you have to be passionate. So anyone who wants to dominate and control the material world, who wants to satisfy their desires, uh, is acting in Rajaguna. Rajaguna is characterized by unlimited longings and desires. I want this. I want that. I want to do this. I want to go there. I want, I want to enjoy this. I want to experience that. Uh, so one becomes the doer and the enjoyer, uh, the controller and the owner. And as a result, one has to experience so much suffering. Why is that? Because the acquisition of material goods causes suffering for others. Who are those others? The people who have to create them. Huh? Why, why does everybody hate the rich? Why does oh, the 99% hate the 1%? Because the 1% owns the factories that produce the goods that all are craving, but only the rich can afford. So these people are working so hard under such debilitating conditions, often uh, lots of pollution, noise, overwork, uh, bad management, being bullied, and so on like that. Of course, they're doing it because they also want to enjoy. <laughs> and they're motivated by material gain. So it's a circle. Huh? The people who are the capitalists who want to have a flourishing economy so they can become super rich create this atmosphere where everybody has to work just to get the, the basic uh, necessities of life, which are actually luxuries. I mean, viewed from the, the big context of human existence. And actually, people in the past who simply worked on a farm, who owned their own land, who had their own family uh, working with them, were much happier because they were more situated in the mode of goodness. See, the result of the mode of goodness is happiness in general. Material happiness, but still, you know. It's better than the mode of passion because the mode of passion leads to suffering, especially when the results of the karma in the mode of passion are finished. Then what happens? Things go away. 
Whatever we have acquired will disappear. Whatever we have done will come to an end. Whatever we have enjoyed will stop. So we see people at the end of life especially suffering very much because they can no longer do all the things and go all the places and have all the stuff that they enjoyed. You know, for example, even if they're married their whole life, the wife or husband may die. And this is tremendous suffering. Try to understand. Much better to counteract those attachments with sadhana and let them go. Ah, but then there's the mode of ignorance. The mode of ignorance says, oh, all this knowledge is too much trouble. I don't need to study the scriptures. I don't even need to work. I can just hang around and get stoned <laughs> and do the minimum. Huh? I don't have to really uh, do anything or have any goal in life huh? except for the basic satisfaction of the senses. Now, this is basically animal life. There's no higher purpose, no knowledge. Uh, no big view of the whole purpose of life or anything like that. You're simply devoid of what we call human qualities. And because of that, the result of actions in the mode of ignorance is being born in an animal body in the next life. It's really terrible. But we can see the animal mentality developing uh, as people do all these terrible actions. For example, meat eating. Meat eating is horrible, horrible, bad, bad karma. Because why? So much resources are used to produce, especially beef, for human consumption, that if everybody was to stop eating meat tomorrow, we would be 70% of the way to the goals of the Paris Environmental Accord. 70%. 70% of what it would take to clean up this planet could be accomplished simply by everyone becoming vegetarian. So that's heavy karma. They're destroying the planet just for the pleasure of their tongue. And what's really going on is that they're addicted to the adrenaline released by the dying animal in its fear and panic at being killed. So they're actually drug addicts, speed freaks, huh? just addicted to adrenaline and craving that drug. So then what happens though, if we do our sadhana, we reach the perfection of the various yogas and we go beyond the mind and ego. Huh? What happens then? Then there's akarma or sometimes called naish karma. That means the karma is still there, but it doesn't affect us. Because why? We are not the body. We are not the ego. We are not the mind. But where is the karma going to come? Maybe it will affect the body, but if we're not the body, then who cares? There's a nice quote by the Buddha that I have paraphrased several times. <laughs> now I want to read the actual quote because it's very, very salient to this point. Where there is no passion for the nutriment of consciousness, where there is no delight, no craving, then consciousness does not land there or increase. Where consciousness does not land or increase, there is no alighting of name and form. Where there is no alighting of name and form, there is no growth of fabrications. Where there is no growth of fabrications, there is no production of renewed becoming in the future. Where there is no production of renewed becoming in the future, there is no future birth, aging, and death. That, I tell you, has no sorrow, affliction, or despair. Just as if there were a roofed house or a roofed hall, having windows on the north, the south, or the east, 
When the sun rises and a ray has entered by way of the window, where does it land? And the querent says, on the western wall, Lord. And if there is no western wall, then where does it land? On the ground, Lord. And if there is no ground, where does it land? On the water. And if there is no water, where does it land? It does not land, Lord. In other words, there is no place for the karma to land, so it doesn't land. If there's nobody saying, I am the doer, I am the recipient of the results of action, then where is the results of action going to land? So yes, it may hit the body, it may hit the mind, but if we're not identified with them, it doesn't affect us. Huh? One simply goes on chanting the mantra, <laughs> being in loving devotion with one's uh, deity or object of love. And of course, the ultimate object of love is the self. This is Ananya Bhakti, and this is what we're going to be going into in the next series coming up. This means Bhakti, or love, in the context of Advaita. So, that's coming up in just a few days after we finish Uladu Narpadu. Om Tatsat. Om Harihi Om.